Dit is Klets met Klaak op Radio Klein Karoo, aangebied dier Cyril Klaak. En een aangename goeie dag aan allemaal van u wat luister uh, wereldwijd. Die Prins van Duisternis het onze kans gegin in Zuid-Afrika vir ochend. So ons kan een lekkere program doen. Ek het een baie, baie interessante gast. En ons gaan so'n bykie gesels oor onder andere bierbrouwerij. Iets waarvan ek net so min weet soos meeste van u. So ons gaan so'n bykie leer. Maar kom ons luister naar ons eerste muziekie. En ons begin met Johnny Clegg's uh, um, Scatterlings of Africa. And that was the most beautiful, beautiful Africa-sounding song, Scatterlings of Africa, by uh, uh, Johnny Clegg. Now, well, I've got a very interesting guest in the studio this morning. Um, uh, Rob Hoffmeyer, good morning. Morning, Cyril. How are you? I'm well, thank you. You, you? you 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 haven't been at a, a townie for a long time. Do you do you feel that you 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 don't belong in a in a town uh, a setup, or do you do you originally come from a town setup? No, I've never actually lived in a town, but um, I've been here now for about five six months and finally got used to all the the strange sounds. <laughs> yeah. Not birds in the morning and yes, chickens. Yes, it's, yes. Uh, um, dirt bin trucks and <laughs> yeah, that's true. People shouting and yeah. screaming. Yeah, there is a difference, yeah. isn't there? There's a sort of a, there's a sort of silence you experience when yes. when you live in the in the in the plot land. Sure. Yes. Yeah. So this sort of beautiful silence. Okay. So you you're a when we what we used to call a when we when when I started <laughs> I'm joking with you now when when uh, I, I moved to George for the first time there were quite a few expats from from Rhodesia. And they would all start off a conversation with when we're in Rhodesia. So they became known as the Wenwees. But I'm sure you, 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 you wanted to stay there. You grew up in, in Bul- did you grow up in Bulawayo? Yes, I, I was born in Bulawayo, grew up in Bulawayo, and I left there in 1981 when I was about 17, 18 years old. Just after matric? Just after school, yes, yeah. O-levels we did there. Yeah. Did they have a, 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 did they have a, 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 a an army uh, com- uh, you know commitment that you had to make if you stayed yes. there did you yes um, uh, we were all called up for um, how long two up. years like it's uh, two years two yes, years yes. yeah I got my call up papers but uh, the war ended just before yeah. I was due yeah. to go so yeah. I, yeah. I, I wanted to go but uh, yeah it's yeah it and, and in, in, in hindsight do you think it, it, it's fine that you haven't been it's not it's it's good that you haven't I think been. so I did feel that I missed out on something and when I came to South Africa I tried it, it, to join it, the police and they wouldn't uh, take me but uh, you I can't be serious why not uh, something to do with my status uh, I was persona non grata for quite a while okay uh, yeah I got South yeah. African citizenship yeah. But uh, I did a bit of work for the police as a reservist yes, for a yes, few yes, years. Yes, yeah, oh. uh, with the flying squad in Cape Town. What do you remember from your 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 years as a child in Bulawayo? We had very much of an outdoor life. I was in scouts, and we spent okay. a lot of time out in the in the Metopus. Every chance we got, we would be out camping or. Um, learning the ropes, <laughs> um, survival skills, that sort of thing. Yeah. Are you are you a bundu basher? Are you still yes, a bundu basher? Oh, I love it. Yes, I love I love the bundu. The really. And and caves? Uh, are you claustrophobic? No, not at all. We we had caves where we in the Metopus. We used to in, um, spend a lot of time. Mm. Um, mm. Us and the Dussies. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, interesting. What do you still use from your childhood, from your childhood years? What's, what's, what's something that you've kept with you all the time? I suppose it would be woodwork. My father was a um, very keen um, woodworker. He made all sorts of things. He made furniture for the house, and I do the same. Mm. Um, something that I've, I've brought brought with me so 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 do you like making a new article or, or if somebody brings you a beautiful piece would you like to do, do you like restoring it you know scraping all the paint off and tightening the 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 mm, i like to make one-offs I, okay. I like to be creative i don't like to do repetitive work um i was making serving boards for restaurants and i yeah. make a couple and i'd be happy with them and then I didn't like it when we got orders for a hundred of the okay, exactly yeah. same thing. Um, yeah. The money was good, but uh, I didn't enjoy Quite the Quite boring. Job. Yeah. Yes. Is there a wood? Is there a type of wood that that you enjoy working with more than another an, an, another type of wood? Uh, yes, I would say wild olive. 
Uh, uh, uh. So is it available readily or do you do it is it's very expensive really um, it comes from namibia okay the yeah. one that i yeah. use it's uh <coughs> i always feel sorry for the tree though yeah i hope that it's an old dead tree that they've, <laughs> they've cut into planks but yeah. it's beautiful hardwood it's uh-huh. uh it's uh very pretty it's is it easier to work with a hardwood or more 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 difficult um i think it's easy because you get a you can get a beautiful smooth finish easily with uh, softer woods like poplar or pine mm. or mm. Um, even Oregon pine. It takes a while to, to get that lovely And yellow finish. wood is quite a soft wood too, is it not? It is, yeah. I remember it's my soft. grandmother had a beautiful dining room table that could mm. seat 14 people. Uh-huh. With yes. stinkwood uh, legs and 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 uh, frame, but but the, a yellow wood top, yellow wood top yes. and she would actually sc- scrub it with a scrubbing brush, oh, yes. and we all, you know, went <laughs> crazy when we saw it doing this. But th- the she, and it had marks; it had the marks of the scrubbing on it. But she just believed that it should be done like that. Uh-huh. And, uh, yeah. well, she probably gave it character. Yeah, she did actually. Yeah. So, so you still make furniture for the just for the for the hell of it, if one I could do. say. I do. I've I've made uh, the bar that we use in our restaurant. I've made a few of the chairs that are there, all of the serving boards that we use, um, spoons, even knives. I do a bit of jewellery, mm-hmm. rings and pendants and that sort of thing. Good heavens! But just for fun. silver or gold, what do you prefer working with? No, they're all out of wood. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yes. yeah. So, okay, so you don't use any metals, or no. you, you do everything out of wood. Everything in wood, yes. And your knives? Do you buy your your blades and then do the knives? The handle? I've made out of um, old uh, trimming horse. horse t- uh, hoof trimming rasps because it's a, a nice steel. Yes, I yes. Like to shape the the blade with an angle grinder. Yes, and then make a wooden handle for it. Well, just after this bit, next bit of music, we're going to talk about that horse connection uh-huh. because there's an interesting horse connection that I didn't know about. So let's listen to to Bon Jovi and his bed of roses, one of Bon Jovi's best. Oh yeah, dude, this was Bon Jovi with bed of roses. Ons gesels met Rob Hofmeier. Ons gaan net nou ook oor hulle plekkie Basil en Bali gesels hier in Oudsoring. But you said something very interesting. You, you made some knives and you used some hoof rasps some uh, hoof rasps to make these knives. Uh, uh, were they readily available, these, ho- these hoof rasps? I mean... Um, well, I go through them. I went through a lot. I've got crates of them. It's okay. Big crates that you can't even lift up. They're so heavy with old rasps. A, a rasp will last you as a farrier trimming horses um, probably about a month. You're not serious? Uh, no. Only a month? Only a month. Depends on how many horses you yeah, do. Obviously, and, uh, yeah. How hard the feet are. But... Yeah, oats on horses have very hard hooves. They're very dry. Really? And, uh, yeah, because of yes. the dry. Yeah. Mm. So, and um, yes, yeah, so there's not much use for it. They're not easy to resharpen. There are people who say they can resharpen um, rasps by using acids and uh, getting letting them rust, but it doesn't really um, do a good job. Mm. It, it mm. Does, does not very really Razor sharp again. So you mentioned farrier. Oh, are you a farrier? Yes, I'm a farrier by trade. And how long does it take you to, to become a farrier? And, and, and that's the first part of the question, so let's handle that one first. <laughs> uh, when I started, it was a five-year apprenticeship, Yeah, um, which I did. There, there used to be a farrier school in South Africa many years ago, probably 40, 50 years ago, uh, run by the Van Royans in Natal. Okay. But that closed, and then the qualified farriers from there could take on apprentices, and I think it's a, an abusive labour, but they kept me for five years before I was really actually qualified yeah. as a farrier. When did they... Th- 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 were there sort of like in certain exams that you had to pass, or certain certain things that you, you were supposed to be able to do, always one horseshoe the same as the next horseshoe, the same as the next horseshoe? There was no... Um, it wasn't officiated. There was no controlling body at the time. So you don't have a paper to say that you're a qualified fairy? No, no. That's a disgrace. Um, I, I could have got that. I think uh, I might have had it somewhere yeah. along the line because the jockey club took sort of some responsibility over it because of the, the racing. Uh, mm, there's certain mm. rules that you've got to comply with as far as uh, shoeing a horse for racing is concerned. Your nails can't protrude more than a certain amount of... Um, certain heights, um, otherwise they're called grippers. They they aid the horse in, in gripping in wet weather. Um, Good heavens. So Are you serious? Yes, yeah. yes. 
So each horse has got to have the same advantage or the same disadvantage. Obviously. Um, so that was some controlling body. They're the ones who, in those days, said that uh, it's a, it was a five-year apprenticeship. Mm-hmm. And after you qualify 10 years of regular um, farrier work before you qualify as a master farrier. Okay. When, okay. when can you start training somebody as soon as you qualify? I've trained it? several um, after I had done 10 years. Um, so I trained several farriers mm-hmm. uh, in my time. Uh, who have gone on, um, had careers, and still shooting horses. Mm. I've got to tell our listeners, you've got a, uh, a very direct stare. You know, you, you look <laughs> you look right through a person. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I don't mean that badly, but I want to ask the following question in, in connection with that. If somebody comes to you and says to you, I want to train as a farrier, and, uh, and you, you have a good look at this chap, would, would you be able to say, well, well, you know, I don't think you're going to make it, or... Uh, would you be able to say now this guy he's he's going to be very good and and what happens to are they are they female farriers i had a an apprentice uh, leanne um who's a female farrier she's operating in george george area uh, she's very successful mm, mm. Um, but as far as choosing an apprentice is concerned i think the most important thing is to See how well they get on with horses, mm. what mm. Their, um, their attitude towards the horse is, what the horse's attitude towards them is, because that's, that's half the job won if you can actually get so, on with So horse. can horses actually feel people's attitudes? I'm can pretty sure. Yes, absolutely. Yes. And, and, and can, can people who work with horses like jockeys and stable people and, and farriers, can, can, they, can they feel Horses' personalities. When somebody brings a horse to you, do you know this is going to be an easy one or it's going to be a difficult one? It's a Probably not. <laughs> <laughs> you, can, you can tell by their reaction to you. Yeah, yes, yeah. Yes, but you can't just look at a horse and say, no, this is an easy, or a, yeah, an easy yeah, horse. Yeah. But as soon as you touch the horse, you see its reaction to you. Yeah. And you yeah. can judge by that. But, but there's a special way of touching horse horses, isn't there? Because I, I, I think some people just scare horses by <coughs> touching them because they do it in the wrong way. Yes. Uh, you've got to be very slow and gentle with them, um, almost chameleon like. Um, where the horse horse get they're very fractious. They uh, they get fright frights very easily. And, and they, is it true that race animal to, uh, Sorry, I interrupted you. Yeah. Um, and, and and is a race horse very skittish, uh, more senti- uh, well, more temperamental? Do you, do you think? Uh, well, a race horse is generally a thoroughbred, and I think a lot of their skittishness when they in racing is uh, brought on by the feed that they get. Okay, they, they're on yeah. high energy feeds. Yeah, and, uh, yeah. Uh, sometimes do you agree with that the, the, the high energy feeds i yes. mean is it is it normal is it sort of a, it's, it's not, not normal, it's, it's not normal but it's it, good for racing but it works <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> what's the worst case that you've ever had as far as a horse and and, and hoofs are concerned i remember doing shoeing in in Oatswan actually shoeing i had to do a full set on an arab stallion and thoroughbred was, thoroughbred no, an uh, arab uh, arabian Okay, okay, yeah. And uh, he didn't want his back feet touched at all. Oh. And uh, I really had to fight with him. I, I was less experienced in those days. I had a lot of fights with horses. Now I can, I seem to have found a way of calming them down. Mm, and, uh, mm. um, yeah, getting the job done without any trauma. Yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah, but yes, that was a... A day that I'll always remember. Yeah, and, and, and just uh, as, because I'm, I'm very inquisitive, where were you kicked the very first time in your body? Where was that first kick? Wh- where did it land eventually? I was, I was kicked between my shoulder blades. <gasps> I was, oh, um, yeah. Yeah. And did anything break? Because I, couldn't uh, I, I have a, d- a dirty suspicion a horse's kick is a very forceful thing. Yes. Uh, my, I couldn't lift my right arm for about... Um, of close to a month, mm. it was mm. almost paralysed. Yes. Good heavens! Yeah, but time cured that. Yeah, let's talk about your restaurant quickly before we play the next <coughs> music. Um, y- you've got a restaurant in Oatsorn. It's in High Street. What's the number in High Street? One five six. One five six. One five six High Street. Um, do, is there a num? Is there a, a telephone number for bookings? Yes, uh, my cell phone number. I'm going to give it to the listeners. If they want to write it down quickly, I'll give it slowly. 072-6500-0700. 072-6500-0700. 
273-1926. Am I right? That's correct. Let's yes. give it to them again. 72 273-1926. And people can phone Rob Hoffmeyer. Uh, the restaurant is called Basil and Barley, 156 High Street in a beautiful building. It's a beautiful old building, isn't yes, it? Yes, it, it is. It's about Lots of character. years old, I think. Lots of character, yeah. Yes. And, and you had your restaurant and everything on the farm, did you, did you not? Yes. You, and, and when did you decide and why did you decide to bring it into town, rather? We started about four years ago. Mm-hmm. Um, we built a, a veranda and a deck around our, our little cottage and that was that's where the brewery is as well but um thorny creek brewery mm-hmm. um but being so far out of town and on a dirt road people would only come on weekends yeah people don't people don't like traveling dirt roads and i yes. grew up we never had any tarred roads i mean I'm, our whole town hofmeyer as a matter of interest your surname yes. that, that, that no tarred road and 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 the farm roads obviously they 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 they, they, they were all dirt roads and and, and there they had a a, a clayish topsoil soil type thing so uh, if it rained it was like a slip and slide to to get to town or, or from the farm or to get from the, the, the town to the farm so one one was sort of used to it and it seems to me that um I, you, you may agree with me or you you may not that the the older cars were more robust they they you know you could take your uh, your chevy and drive the dirt road and and it would survive without a uh, uh, for quite a long time but nowadays you have to have a you have to have a four by four to drive in town <laughs> because of the potholes yes the potholes and uh, yeah people like parking on pavements too yes yeah uh, uh, this i saw this for the very first time when when the when the Kinsterfeer started, you know, so you're, so, uh, would you now that you're in town like to become involved in the Kinsterfeer, uh, as uh, you know, offer a special for that time or? Um, we opened in town just before the the Kinsterfeer yeah. of, of this year, and we were involved. We did a, a beer and cheese pairing. Oh, lovely! And, yes, uh, we had art displayed in our in our restaurant, and we also had a, a one lady act twice a day, every day during the, the festival. So mm. we were involved. Um, so And, and yes. did it work for you? It we worked very well. Yes. Uh, really? Yes. Oh, we right. were yeah. so busy. Yeah. It was really jumping into the deep end, Yeah, coming from our tiny little... Uh, but it's very interesting, restaurant. isn't it? Uh, it's, a, it's a lovely festival, I must no, it say. Is, absolutely. Yeah, it is, yes. yeah. I used to try, when I was teaching, I used to drag the kids to the Grahamstown Festival. They had a special matric festival a week after the main fest. You know, they... It's, it's not, take these Afrikaans speaking. I oh, always mm-hmm. taught in Afrikaans schools, English in Afrikaans I schools. And I used to take these bootkeys and, and I loved them because they they went there and they experienced all that and came back different people. Now, when, when you, you experienced the festival, did you feel a bit different about Oatsorn as a town after that? I've, I've always attended the festivals. For the yeah. past 20 plus years, I've always come to Oatsorn when I, I lived in Neisner. Mm. And mm. Uh, so um, it's, it's just a, such a wonderful festive time. Isn't it? And, uh, and, yes, and there's a, a lovely vibe in town, isn't there? Yes, there is, yes. Yeah. It seemed to fade away a little bit yeah. think, because of COVID, but yeah. it's, it's definitely coming back with... Yeah. with How did Avengers. COVID affect you people out there in, in the bush, as, 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 as it were? Mm. Did you... Was it bad? Because <laughs> no. I, I'll tell you, let me give you my experience very quickly. <clears throat> I was at that stage helping out at school. I was already past retirement age, but obviously English teachers are at a premium, so I was back there. And uh, when we went down to the staff room for break, the principal stood up and said, ladies and gentlemen, you must get every child's email uh, uh, or Zoom particulars because um, the school is closing tomorrow, which is a week before the the, the um, April holidays. Uh, and we think it's going to take quite a long time before we open again. And I sat in the staff room and I thought, oh, please, we've had a swine flu, we've had, um, uh, what's it, avian flu, we've had all these things, we're definitely not going to have a a difficult time. Little did I know that after nearly a year, 
mm-hmm. you know. So you taught kids on. How, so how did it affect you, people? Were you, or are you used to being on your own? I mean, if you live in a, in in in, in on a farm, I think I think if you if you're happy on a farm, you must be a sort of person who, who likes to be on your own for a while, or on your own for part of the day, or on your own for a bit. <laughs> I don't know. Mm, I wouldn't say I'm. I'm not a loner. Yeah, uh, my wife and I were together. Yeah, at least. Yeah, COVID was a very different time for us. It was. Um, I don't know how much I can say, but I was. I had a very sought after product. Yes. What? Um, I've a brewery. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I see what you mean. Yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So Let me tell you quickly. The, the, the pineapple suddenly became very yes. expensive. Yes. 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 Yeah, so, so yeah. So it you, yeah. wasn't a bad time for us. Yeah. Being so. very far out of well, uh, far out of town. Yeah. Out yeah. of anyone's eyes, but yeah. people, a lot of people knew us. But it was quite a sad time, I it think. Was a it was a very sad, sad time, yeah. Okay, so you're a farrier and, and, and you're also a brewer. So after the f- next bit of music, we're going to brew some beer, aren't we? Sure, yes. Good. Why not? And we're going to listen to Nikita by Elton John. Right, and that was Nikita. And you, you're listening to Radio Klein Karua, um, which broadcasts worldwide on the internet. And we're having a very interesting ch- chat with, with Rob Hoffman. Rob, beer, let's talk beer things. W- what motivates a guy to start making beers? Because you're thirsty or because <laughs> you like beer? Or is it because it's an interesting challenge? I, it, you, you seem to me uh, like a person who likes a challenge. Somebody says to you, oh, all right, what are you going to do with all these rasps? You make knives. You know, it's like you know, somebody gives you lemons, you make lemonade type thing. Uh, is, is that how you started Brewing beer, um, possibly. I, I get bored very easily, so okay. I always need something new to do. Mm-hmm. Um, I do chop and change quite quite a lot. Yeah, but, uh, keeps life interesting. It does. Yes, yeah, it does. Um, and I started off as a home brewer. Yes, with just uh, twenty liters at a time. Okay, now stop just there because I'm I'm I I, I want to know about this. I, when you start brewing, what ingredients do you need to have, and what 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 uh, utensils do you need? Do you need pots and pans, or a tank, or do you need uh, sterilized or st- clean water, or how do you go about? Where do you start? What do you have to uh, have? As as a small home brewer, the way I started was um, I had a, a beer keg, a thirty liter beer keg, which mm-hmm. I I cut the top off just mm-hmm. with an angle grinder. Now that was my it's like a big kettle okay. that you need to boil. Okay. Um, and then the the other tanks um, to ferment in are just buckets, 20-litre buckets. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then you need a few pipes and uh, a little pump to um, to cool. The, you've got to put the, the hot beer, they call it wort, you've got to push that through a chiller unit. Mm-hmm. To cool it down very fast. So is that a pipe going through a, bo- a, a, a th- tank of water? Yes, something like that. Yes, uh, yes. Maybe with uh, some ice in it just to mm, get it mm, nice and cold. Mm. So yeah, very um, you, home brewers. It doesn't cost you a lot of money to start up. It's very mm. very easy. And what type of beer was the first one you made? First one was an amber ale. Yes, is um, it's a your base base malt is is barley that uh, malted barley, mm-hmm. um, and then to get some color and character into it, you add roasted barley, mm-hmm. lightly roasted mm-hmm. barley. Mm-hmm. Do you roast your own barley, or do you go buy buy this this roasted barley? Right somewhere? in the beginning, my neighbour uh, planted barley, mm-hmm. and I was just then interested in brewing, and he mm-hmm. said he would give me some. So I actually malted it myself, mm-hmm. which uh, malt meaning that you you allow it to sort of start uh, growing. Yes, yeah. you 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 get it to a stage where the little roots come out of yeah. each, each grain. Yes. They called shits, by the way. S C H I T Z. Say that again. S S T H S S C H or S H I T Z. Okay, S-C-H-I-T-Z, okay, shits, I shits, think, yes. lovely, shits, yeah. yeah. Do you use those shits? You've got to get rid of those little okay. shits. Okay, okay, <laughs> that's why they're called that, yes. <laughs> probably. Yeah, <laughs> okay, so so yeah, and then you melt it, and, and so, you yeah, do you that by putting it uh, in a damp tray or whatever. Yes, you wet it, yes, yes. You, you keep it wet, um, and then as soon as the, uh, there's a little, um, the little thing that pops out of the, the husk when you see something start to germinate. Um, that grows inside the husk. It's called an acrospire. 
An agrospire. Acrospire. Acrospire. So when that gets to the length of the husk, before it pops out, you've got to dry that grain very, very quickly. Okay, okay. Yeah. And that is malted um, barley. Yeah. It changes the, the uh, starches inside from unfermentable starches to fermentable starches. Interesting, yeah. And sugars. Yeah. It's, it's like... There was a woman who offered a bread making course, I think, uh, at the f- during the festival. Cold store, possibly. Yeah, no. yeah. So, so who, who calls herself the accidental baker? Yes, I'm so yes. trying so hard to speak to her, uh, to have a yeah, uh, to talk to her, uh, because yes. a, a, a bread making and is 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 to me a magical process. You know, I mean, mm, especially yeah, uh, and and I'm sure beer making is 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 as magical. I think they yeah they're related. they're very related. Yeah. <coughs> so so uh, you you've got the malted barley then then. Yes. Do you yeah, or do you roast this? Uh, what this, do you roast? That, yes, you that can roast part of it. Yeah, um, by doing what? You put it in an oven. Just in an oven, yes. At a certain at a certain temperature. <clears throat> I I didn't have any um, recipe for how uh, how long it should roast for. I just roasted it until it's turned like a golden brown. Okay, okay. So, yeah. but, yeah. but um, I used barley now from Belgium, mm-hmm. and they um, they have malteries there. They're extremely experienced. Um, they their product is far superior to to our local product, and 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 Belgium is well known as the country where 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 monks started making yes, beer. Trappist Trappist beers. Yes. There's actually a beer called Trappisten in in Belgium, which is a lovely beer. Uh, you know, and, and and there are many, many, many. Um, well, I don't know. You said one, one doesn't call a beer a boutique beer. You call it a, a, a craft beer. We call it craft beer. Yeah. Some people yeah. do call it boutique beers, but uh, yeah. Never so. that. Okay, so so you made this 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 beer, and w- were you so impressed with it that you decided you were going to try different types? Well, I all of a sudden had new friends. Oh. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine. Yes, yes, I can uh, imagine. And then somebody encouraged me to upscale it, and yeah. I thought about it for a while, and uh, I discovered a brewery in Cape Town that had gone bankrupt, mm-hmm. Harfield Brewery. What brewery? Harfield. Yes, yes. Was their name. And, yeah. Uh, I went to have a look at their equipment, and it was going for for nice a, a and very cheap, good price. Mm-hmm. Yes. Um, so I I bought the whole system, mm-hmm. which is a five hundred liter system. Uh, Do you need a big garage for this uh, this system? Well, yes, I have a big garage, so um, it it was easy. Uh, mm. All of my woodworking equipment went out. And the brewery <laughs> equipment went in. You so did open air woodworking. Yes, you did. I did, yeah, yes, you did yeah. 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 Because you can so do that outside if you. Yeah. In Oatsburg, yes. Yeah. Yes. Well, yeah. Until recently, we didn't have much rain. <laughs> it's true, but but you know it's it's wonderful to see that it has rained so much because for quite a few years we haven't had much. Yes, we had a seven year drought. Yeah. It's yeah. There. Uh, 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 but but seven years is that magical number from I think in the, from the Bible there's the story of the seven lean years and the seven good years or something yes. like that. Mm-hmm. Now I, um, just to interrupt you, we went. I, I started teaching at Carnarvon, uh, which is in the middle of the Karoo, when I was a young teacher, and we got my wife and I got there at the end of a seven year drought, and it was in. Um, we started school started in January, obviously. And in February, March, it started raining. And we'd never seen the Karoo so beautiful. But I was on the first floor of the school building. And just below me, if I looked through my window, was the kindergarten. And when it started raining, these big drops plumping down in, this, in, the, in the dust, I saw the, the, the sub-A kids, the grade one kids, out, outside. And at break, I said to this teacher, I said, what did you do? It's raining. You know, she said to me, you know, those kids are six years old. They have not experienced rain. Oh, of course, yes. So when it started raining, she took them out into the rain just so they could feel that. You know, do, do you like oats or a dryer? Uh, 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 it, because it's, yeah, it's got its own beauty when it's dry. It has. No, I prefer wet. You prefer wet, the yeah. river's running. Yeah. The river yeah. um, running past our farm and it's been running Interesting name, uh, by the way, while we're talking about a river. You call yourself Th- Thorny Creek Brewery. Is that what you call yourself? Yes. Uh, because of what? Because we're on the Doering River. Yeah. And it's just a, sort of an English-American kind of a spin on yeah, lovely. the Doering River. Yeah, here, yeah. Very, Thorny very Creek. Nice, per, nice poetic name. Okay, so so that was the first brew uh, beer you made. What was uh, what did you decide to do then? Are there different types of beers? How do they differ? Explain a little bit to me about different types there, of beer. There are many different types of beer, but 
um, what you as a brewer are encouraged to do is to stick to style. Okay. Because your customers would order, for instance, an amber ale. And if you've got half, it's uh, something that you've brewed, which is half a vice and half an amber, then they don't really know what they're getting. You don't really know what to give them. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. people tend to like a certain style of beer. Obviously, uh, yeah. Each one's, yeah. Uh, very, each one's different. So, yes, there are several styles mm-hmm. of beer. And, um, do, you, do, you, do you talk about light as far as color is concerned and dark beers? Because I remember when I, and, and it's, <coughs> it's an ale, obviously, or, or something like that. I, when, I went, when I went to Ireland for the first time, I decided I was going to have a, a, a real Irish stew with a Guinness. I didn't want to have a Guinness in England because it, wasn't, it, it ir- originated in Ireland. And it was the first Guinness I had, which is a dark, thick, thick it's, 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 it's an, is it an ale? Is it an, a, a, it's a thick beer. I think what what determines an ale from, for instance, a lager is the yeast you use. Oh, uh, okay. Um, yeah. An ale is a top fermenting yeast, and lager is a bottom fermenting mm. yeast. Mm. So it it probably was an ale. Yeah, yeah, it probably was. Yeah, very nice actually. Oh, so, yeah. As, okay. So uh, if anybody goes to to your restaurant. To basil and barley, can they order a a a, a, a beer taste? Like, yes. Yeah. yes we do so beer you tasting. do you give them different types of beer in <coughs> in different glasses to taste. Um, if they do a beer tasting, I use little glasses, mm-hmm. put them all in a row, and explain the difference between them. And can people book beer tastings with you? Yes, yes, you can. So they can. Yeah. So let's give Just them the number again. Zero seven two two seven three one nine two six, and if you really like beer, you must go and taste it because um, um, sometimes you'd be very surprised. What's your favourite beer? What's your favourite one that you make? Um, <laughs> I like them all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, you wouldn't make them if you didn't like them. I'm sure. No, yeah, no. I, I like a Russian stout in winter, mm-hmm. and I would say a Weiss, a German Weiss in mm, summertime. Mm, mm. It's more refreshing beer. Yeah. Yeah, the, the, the Brits have this thing about hot beer mm. and hot, yeah, you know, yeah. No, I, so I, you I you I like yours nice and cool. Yes, nice yes, and cool. Yes. It doesn't it can be? Yeah, it must be chilled. Twenty yeah. outside, it's still like a cold beer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I agree with you. Okay, so you you've still got a few beers that you make there that you have to tell us about. So so go for it. Um, okay, if we go from the lightest color beer, yes, uh, the German Weiss. Uh, it's a 5%. Um, what makes it a vice is the amount of wheat that's that's in with the barley. It's okay, do, you, do, you, do you need wheat as well for, yes, for a beer? Okay, yes. okay. Most beers, all of my beers have a little bit of wheat in them. Um, wheat has a different type of starch which aids uh, head retention, the, the foam that, that sits on top of the beer. It doesn't disappear very quickly. Um, that's part of the way a beer should look, yeah. I believe. Is it called a head? The My head, dad yes. always used to refer to the head of the beer. Yes. And um, is, there a, is there an art, I'm digressing, but it's so interesting, is there an art in pouring a beer so that there's a certain head to, to the glass of beer? Um, yes. Uh, no, I wouldn't say it's an art, maybe a technique. Yes. But um, I'm fortunate that my beer taps have... Oh, oh you have all function. your beers on tap? Yes, oh. they're all on tap. Can people buy bottles of beer from you? I was wondering about, uh, uh, do you have to buy a bottle top uh, fitter or something like that? that or don't uh, do yes, bottle like your beer? A capper. Yes. 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 Is it called a capper? Yeah. yeah. So people yeah. can come to you and say, okay, I want a, a case of one of your, your, your types. Not right now. I have I've, I've bottled um, all of my beers in the past, but since opening the new restaurant, I've... I haven't had time to, to bottle. So, so they're all on tap. It's yeah. all on tap at yeah. the moment, yes. Which makes it nice and, and, and interesting. So yes. it's, yeah. And people come and we... we you have a nice... The social. Yes, 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 because, yeah. Otherwise, you take your bottle of beer and there you go and you can't yes. really appreciate it. I do uh, have growlers. I have two-litre growlers, which I can fill from the taps. Uh, mm. uh, What's a growler? To, sorry, growler is a, is a bottle. Okay. A big bottle. Is, is that, uh, yeah. Is that why it's called a growler? That's... Uh, I don't it, know why it's called a growler. <laughs> <laughs> Does your beer talk to you? I once went, took um, a group of kids to a to a, a winery, a very well known winery in the Cape, 
and this winemaker was telling the kids that when the beer st- uh, when the wine starts talking to you, you know, when it bubbles and gurgles and and spatters, <laughs> does your beer talk to you? Do you well, know what it says at a certain stage? While it's fermenting, yes, that's the only time I notice it talks to me. Yeah, but but you know when to, to stop that talking, don't you? you? Do you know exactly when to? Uh, the fermentation stops on its own. Really? Yes. Amazing. It's just the yeast eating up the sugar. Okay. So yeah. when that's when the yeast has run out of sugar, it's it goes to sleep. Now, do you have to buy yeast? Do you have dry yeast that you you put with your, or do you do you make your? I know the old people, my my parents, my grandmother, my Afrikaans grandmother. She used to have a a a, 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 a plank yeast. She used to call oh, it yeah. a yeast um, propagating thingy that she kept in a in a cool dark spot, and I think it it, it had something to do with potato or something like that and water. That okay. she's used for her bread. Do you, do you buy uh, powdered yeast that you put yes, into? Yes, I buy. Yeah. Uh, I think it's freeze freeze dried. Okay, uh, fr- yeah, dried yeah, yeast. yeah. Uh, It's also from Belgium. Okay. Um, Is it expensive so to to import these things from Belgium? Because they, they previously in Ertz and, it's, and and she's not here any. She's here, but she doesn't have the business anymore. She used to have this woman used to be a chocolatier, so she used to order, like in bricks. Of 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 Belgian chocolate to make her, mm. her chocolates. Do you, do you order like in bulk things, or is it expensive to import these things? Is it I don't I don't import them myself. I get them from someone in Cape Town. Oh, lovely! Yeah, companies yeah. who import um, import brewing ingredients. Yeah, so it's it's very easy, but it is expensive. This mm. is why there's a, a premium on craft beer, the, mm. the final product. Um, it's also my beers are quite concentrated as opposed to a watered down um, mm. mass produced are you beer. talking alcohol content no not no um, the the mouth feel of the mm. the, mm. Uh, the beer it's it's um, it's got a lot more body than mm. than a, a it's not a watery it's beer. not a watery beer no. it's, it's like in a full beer yes. like, yeah. very nice yeah so so do you organise beer tasting evenings? Do you do you, do, you, do or are you in planning to organise beer tasting evenings? I mean, I think it must be quite interesting if you in, if you like beer, or you you drink beer regularly to attend a, a, a beer tasting evening. What what we do is the during the last KK and K we had a beer tasting and cheese beer and cheese pairing. Okay, uh, okay. We did that yeah. twice a day, and we've got the classic coming up soon, which we we're going to do the same again. Okay, so so do you do the pairing? You decide yes. which cheese goes with which beer. I do, but people can swap them around and see okay. if they can yeah. match something. So how do you know the what the right one is? Or do you are you a cheese connoisseur too? No, no, I'm not. Uh, You're not I love you? cheeses. Yeah, um, but I I would put a strong cheese with a, a heavy beer. Okay, and a mild yeah, cheese yeah. With a, a milder beer. Yeah, yeah. Um, seems to make sense to me. Oh. Now, now your restaurant's called uh, um, Barley and Herb. Basil, or ba- and basil, basil, well, basil yes. and herb. Sorry, I'm all wrong. Basil and herb. I'm, I'm sorry. I mentioned the, the 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 name of the restaurant all wrong, and you didn't even correct me. You just let me go on. But okay, <laughs> and I've got it right here. Basil and herb. Uh, basil uh, and basil barley. And barley. There we go. So the barley part is is is, is refers to the beer. Yes. On, but you also make a very interesting uh, product with 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 the barley when you've when you've yes, used uh, it. When I finished brewing, mm-hmm. the, the grain that's left over we call spent grain, mm-hmm. and we dry that very quickly. It's not easy now because of our um, humidity, mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. it's when it's normally very dry. Do you just put it out to dry? You, you put yes. it out in the sun to dry? I make, I've made big tables with um, shade cloth, mm-hmm. like, almost like big hammocks, but mm-hmm. they, uh, mm-hmm. they're quite taut. And um, so we dry it in the sun very quickly. And then it can either be used just like that as an additive in your bread making, or we mill it into a fine powder mm-hmm. and that can be um, introduced into your mix for making finer things like cakes and scones. And Amazing. That sort of yeah. So it's um, basically had all the gluten taken out of it because that's what you're going to be drinking. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, yes. But then yes, that's yes, been yes. converted as well into yeah. alcohol and yeah. CO2. But uh, so it lowers the, the gluten in the in the bread, or yeah. in, in 
whatever. So you you you, you, you act one one thing that that people should know is that if they buy bread from your restaurant or if they have bread in your in your restaurant, uh, it's it's going to be more or less gl- gluten free. Um, it's yeah, I would say it's about twenty thirty percent less gluten than mm. than, mm. Uh, than normal bread. Now, who's the baker? My wife is the baker. Okay. Olga. Yes. Oh, yeah. Unfortunately, she couldn't join us today. Yeah, but she, she, you, you, you can come and chat to me again any time. I mean, I don't Great. mind. Thank you. But, but, but it, 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 now, do you have any influence on on the menu of the restaurant, or is that Olga's problem? That's yeah. Olga's. I wouldn't say it's a problem. She she loves she loves she doing does. it. Yeah. Yes. yeah. She's very very creative. Uh, her presentation of of meals is is fantastic. Mm. She uses a lot of edible flowers and uh, mm, mm. a lot of um, decor on on mm. her on her meals. Do you, you you're talking about edible flowers now? You said to me the other day you you produce your own um, materials. Do, are we, you? A we grow vegetables. We mm. we grow them organically, fruit and vegetables mm-hmm. on our farm. On your farm, yes, and that is all used in a in the. In the menu. Okay, what makes a, a fruit an organic fruit? Explain that to me. We don't use any pesticides, okay. uh, insecticides, herbicides, uh, fertilizers. Everything is natural. We so you, you, you don't use anything uh, artificial? No, nothing at all. Nothing poisonous. Nothing, yeah. So, so if you get an infestation of, 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 of whatever on your, on, your, on your vegetables or fruit, how do you, how do you, do you, do you get a hoho to eat the other hoho? If, if we I'm haven't got that specialized yet, so yeah. we, we have a, a very keen Malawian who goes and squashes worms all over the place, <laughs> <laughs> catches bugs. That's but, lovely, uh, yeah. We, uh, yeah, we, we do have losses sometimes yeah. with yeah. Uh, um, infestation of, of insects. But, you know, isn't it interesting, we're sitting here now and we're talking about losses. In the olden, the good old days, in the good old days, before there were all these pesticides and horrible things that people have to use now to make things grow and so on. Uh, uh, farmers, I think, uh, uh, were prepared to have that special bit of loss that goes to the to the little animals that God made, I well, suppose. I think yeah. we should share with nature. <laughs> yeah. Yes, we yeah. can claim everything. So, yeah, so so it, it's it's quite natural that that some of it is lost to 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 other little thingies. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Do birds you, as well. Birds yeah. Have the, the fair share. Do you, do you, do you find that at, uh, on your farm where you work organically, there, there there's a, a, a wider variety of, of, of natural life uh, than on on farms surrounding you because of, of the fact that there there are no pesticides or anything like that. Um, probably yeah. yes. I haven't compared it directly with with other farms, but I, I remember somebody telling me once that in the old days when they travelled um, a certain route, when they got to the other side, there would be maybe a thousand bugs squashed on the windscreen. Mm. Now there's hardly true. anything. That's very true. So that, yeah, that shows you. Yeah, and it's true. I can remember that. We you, 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 you have to clean the windscreen mm. because there are lots of bugs on there. <laughs> That's true. So, 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 how did you, just as a matter of interest, you come f- come from Bul- Bulawayo? Eventually, you went to Cape Town. You became a farrier. What made you come and live in the Karoo? Because it's a it's a unique area, and it's it's it's, it's sparsely populated, and and it's it's dry and arid. Um, I once spoke to a Belgian person, seeing that we now mentioned Belgian uh, things and beers, and he said to me, "The wonder of 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 of, of South Africa is the fact that there's so much nothingness." And they love traveling the Route 62 because there's, there's big, huge open spaces. And when, when my Belgian friends come, I always take them through the Maringsport and over the Swartberg because they've never, ever seen a, a chasm like that. They've never seen a, a port like that because, you know, Belgium is quite, re- well, relatively flat, except for the Ardennes where, where they have a little bit. So, so it, 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 what made you come to this, this dry, arid, open well, my wife and I were looking for a property to buy, just some land where we could make something yeah. uh, of, of it, make, make a living from it. Yeah. And we traveled all over up the West Coast. We went as far as Darling. We went oh. um, uh, all over the um, East Coast and uh, just came across the Karoo, uh, the Clan Karoo. I had been coming here for, for years before that. I knew the area. Mm-hmm. Um, but 
I know it's not the the answer you're looking for, perhaps, but uh, the price of land was absolutely okay. Amazing. Yeah, why not? I mean, so we, absolutely. We got Twenty-four yeah. hectares for a very very good price. Yeah. Was it was it bare? Was it or was it a run, a, 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 a practicing farm? Was it used? Was it, it was part of a farm, but it it wasn't being used, and it had a. A labourer's cottage, a broken down labourer's cottage on it. That you moved hall. into first and then you started building yourself a little abode there. Yes, well we, we rented a place for a year uh-huh. close by, a kilometre yeah. away, yeah. while we renovated this little cottage, yeah. which has now become the brewery, brewery and the restaurant. Okay, okay. So you, you, uh, you, you've got the restaurant in town, Baslin Bali, which I'm getting the name right yes. for a change. <laughs> and and okay. what do you call your restaurant on the farm? Also Baslin Bali? We got a... Um, a mobile home. It's a big old red um, bus. Yes, yes, yes. Old Mercedes bus that used yes. to belong to SA Breweries, ironically enough, um, before we even thought of a brewery. Yes. And we put a road in. Uh, we, we got a, a, an excavator and um, just cut and filled a road up to one of the, the, the highest hill on the farm. And we towed this bus up there. Good heavens! As a as accommodation with a beautiful yeah. view. Yeah, it should and, uh, it should be it should have a fantastic. We painted it bright red. Yeah, yeah. So you can see it from about four kilometers if you away if yeah. you're coming yeah. towards the farm. Yeah. So we called the restaurant the Red Bus. Yeah. So it was Basil at uh, Thorny Creek Brewery and the Red Bus Cafe. Okay, okay, and 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 you're going to re- you start this again? You've you yes, you're, we ju- we just put it on hold for a while because yeah. we started a new restaurant. But now that this one is up and running, we're going to duplicate all the equipment we took from mm. the from the farm, and uh, so the red bus will be running again. It will be running again. Yes, oh, very fantastic. popular with cyclists and uh, adventure bikers. Do, do many of these? Uh, we've got one minute left. That's heartbreaking. We've chatted all the time, and we've got one minute left. And I have to say that it was very interesting to chat to you. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you so much. I appreciate it so much. And really, we must talk again. So, so go well. Thank you. And now is the time for Suleen Haman. And Suleen gaan vandag for ons pijnappel slaai maak vir die braai. And here is Kani Son by die Klein Kuro, so ons gaan so'n bykie braai.